Welcome to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Vantage Circle, the simple and AI-powered rewards and recognition platform for employee engagement. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Vantage Influencers Podcast. Today, we're diving deep into the dynamic intersection of leadership, well-being, and the unique challenges of our VUCA world. Our exploration will take us through the evolving landscape of leadership strategies and how to adapt to the ever-changing environments that we face. I'm your host for the show, Shushmita, and for the discussion today, we are honored to have Greenma Hubbell with us. Greenma is a leader at a global automaker, award-winning HR coach, and expert. She is a trusted voice on LinkedIn and an influential figure in leadership and well-being. Her journey has taken her from the heart of the Middle East to the vibrant hub of Dubai, where she continues to inspire and empower through her extensive workshops and coaching sessions. Rainwa, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for hosting me. Thank you for joining me. And um, how are you today? It's fantastic to have you with us today. Thank you. I'm really excited for the podcast and uh, excited to share more about my experience, my learnings and, uh, and tips and hints that might serve your community of learners and listeners. Thank you for, for having me once again. Thank you. So you have had such a diverse and impactful career journey, Renva, from uh, starting out in the travel and tourism industry to your current role in coaching and leadership development uh, could you share with us uh, some key milestones and experiences that have shaped your corporate journey? Mm. Well, that is an interesting deep dive, and I definitely need more than a podcast to share. <laughs> mm. But uh, I literally started my career really young. I was at the age of 15 when I stepped out of school to start working uh, and supporting my family. Um, and then uh, I literally found myself working with my family, my father specifically, in re-establishing his um, travel and tourism organization. So I really started adopting an entrepreneurial mindset uh, ever since that age, uh, which has served me uh, a lot actually throughout my career and my journey and my tenure in the corporate and business environment. And um, slowly but surely after then, when I got the grip of how does the travel and tourism industry works, I found myself keen to go back to my um, school days where I have continued my educational journey. And then right after I have graduated from university. Uh, throughout university, I had uh, jobs here and there just to continue um, driving uh, that monetary perk into my pocket, let's put it this way. Uh, and a lot of the learnings happened throughout uh, that cycle of my life. Uh, from, you know, understanding how corporates work, managing and maneuvering uh, my way through turbulent environments, uh, also managing and juggling between jobs and education. So multitasking came to me at a really young age as well. Uh, later, you know, after graduation, I joined the corporate world and uh, it was actually, you know, where I really found myself uh, dealing with people, with humans. And um, because the humans are my passion, so I'm a people passionate person uh, and I believe that no business in the world can strive without its people. So if we don't, you know, pump that, that octane in our people and clean octane let's put it this way right in our people i don't think we can have um successful uh, business outcomes so slowly but surely i found myself climbing up the leadership ladder traveling around uh, you know the region uh, to set up uh, businesses projects uh, and uh, international assignments until you know i totally relocated officially and found a new home for me in the uae Mm -hmm. um, Dubai specifically and I've been based in Dubai for the past 15 years uh, it was a journey of uh, exploration I have to say and uh, you know throughout all of this these years I can tell you there's a lot and plenty of milestones that I have achieved in my life and remarkable lessons also that uh, today they're not only lessons but they are actually what guide me uh, throughout my, the future that I am you know carving for myself um, in a way or another. So thank you for asking me this question. 
Okay. Given your rich background and experience, Karenva, uh, let's delve into the topic of uh, leading with well-being in a VUCA world. Love that. You have been a prominent advocate for uh, creating inclusive cultures and navigating VUCA environments. How do you see the relationship between effective uh, leadership and fostering well-being, especially in today's uh, rapidly changing world? Okay, so see, I don't see personally leadership is a standalone element and well-being is a standalone element as well. Uh, I mean, they these two elements, they don't operate operate parallelly. I see them integrating together. Um, it's it's more like, you know, you, the human body, you have the head, you have the heart and you have the gut. Mm. It's the same as well when it comes to businesses. We, we need people who are, uh, you know, leaders in the business and they, they come well equipped with the well-being mindset and I know a lot of organizations today when they speak about well-being they say yeah we have a very nice office we have you know a pool uh, a game or we 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 go out for a jog and something like that or we do let's say step challenges yes this is great well-being activity or activities or set of activities but this is not you know the the ultimate or the pinnacle of what does leading with well-being really means. When I talk about leading with well-being, I'm talking about, you know, from a system perspective or from an organization perspective, to have policies and procedures in place that are human orientated or human centered. And when I say this, what does that mean? It means, you know, looking at maternity or looking at paternity time. You know, labor laws all over the world, they do have their sets, you know, dates, but you know, why don't organizations go above and beyond if they really want to stand up from the market? So that would be something to consider when it comes to parenthood, because a lot of people, especially when I'm talking from a GC, GCC perspective, there are a lot of expats and the younger generation also is stepping into the, yeah. you know, to the marketplace and they are also becoming, you know, parents. So how do we as organizations make sure that we're having the right talent on board, but also, you know, setting uh, policies and procedures in place that are friendly, that are ESG centric, right? That are sustainable, that are uh, helpful for the well-being of our people and can also influence in a way or another. And when I say influencing, right? The nine to five job is no longer an option. Uh, and I see a lot of organizations, um, especially after, you know, the latest pandemic, they still keep pushing for their people to come back to work, which yeah. is okay, fine, I understand. But mm -hmm. that, you know, the world has proved to you that, you know, people can literally deliver on their objectives, even when they are miles away from the FaceTime, which we advocate, which we, which we love at Absolutely, some point, because yeah. it makes us in control. So I think, you know, if we step away from the really control true. aspect and look at it from, you know, the human aspect to say, okay, you know what, my people have been away from the office for quite some time, I could, I could tell today as a leader, who is able to perform remotely and who's not able to perform remotely. And the question is if that person is not able to perform rem remotely was he or she performing on the job when they were like in the business in front of me yes or no if that's the case then you know there are different strategies now going back to systems and organizations it's not only this because we are adopting a hybrid work environment you know a lot of policies can uh, be implemented in businesses where you can have people working um you know uh, during summer break they can always work probably from their home countries um, you know, and, and why not allowing, you know, that hybrid model to be a little bit flexible in a way, you know, you don't need to commute twice a week to the office, uh, but you can also have, so you can commute to the, um, during, you know, a normal working week, twice a week to the office or three times, but also you have the flexibility if it's summer and you want to go work remotely from somewhere, hey, you know, you have up to two or three months, why not? I mean, as long as, you know, there are no uh, tax on that or there are no legal obligations or no financial obligations, then, you know, organizations can consider that as an option, right? So when I talk about leading with well-being, I also need to consider, you know, the human aspect or the personal aspect of my people. Like, you know, 
are they, uh, you know, uh, do I have a psychological safe environment where my people come in and say openly, you know, I need some time off or, you know what, I'm having a, um, you know, a hard time. Uh, I'm actually, uh, you know, suffering from anxiety. Is this situation or am I as a leader accepting that or I'm putting a stigma or I'm, you know, what am I doing? How is my thinking? Uh, am I supporting or, or am I judging or am I influencing my team to support that? How do I lead, you know, with the head, the heart and the gut simultaneously? And we always, you know, work on elevating our uh, KPIs when it comes to our brain, but we're never in, uh, enhancing our KPIs or accelerating, you know, the power of our heart generated KPIs. Because when you lead from the heart and there's an intelligence in there, right? This is when you are able to create a psychological safe environment, a happy environment. People are open, people are happy to commute to work, people are excited to deliver, and it's no longer perceived as a job, but rather perceived as an environment where, you know, I can join because I can thrive there. I can join because this company echoes my, uh, you know, belief system. Does the company offer me the freedom of choice? Does the company empower me? Does my leader empower me? Or what is happening when it comes to leading with well-being at core? Mm. And people also, you know, employees also have started to realize that uh, work-life balance and flexibility are probably the most important things left in our lives now. So I, this uh, reminds me of uh, uh, one study, uh, actually, a uh, survey that uh, that a very known organization has taken up. Mm -hmm. They uh, literally asked their uh, employees, uh, what would you prefer, uh, a promotion or work from home? Mm. And what was the percentage like? I'm interested. Mm. It was a very high percentage very high percentage. I don't exactly remember the number, but work from home won the wow. <laughs> survey. That you gave it just gave me goosebumps. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we are actually kind of realizing now what's important to us, right? Because it's just one life. Of course, I'm. I mean, we yes. are not robots operating in an in a system, right? We are humans, and what does that mean? Being a human is like, you know, you serve a certain organization. But also, right, mm. you have a life outside, right? And, and businesses, when they understand yeah. and leaders, when they understand that this ex-employee in the organization also has a life, you know, it makes so much sense. I mean, we are not robots. Simply, we are humans. We're human beings and not human doings. <laughs> very true. Very true. <laughs> It's human beings. Yesterday, only we had a, a session with one of the, you know, physicians, mm -hmm. actually, mental mm -hmm. health physician. Um, she was talking about uh, human beings and human doings. So we are beings, but we kind of forget about of that. Of course, unfortunately. So really, really incredible and valuable insights, uh, Renva. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, empathy uh, is something we often mention is a crucial trait for leaders in uh, turbulent times. Mm. So how can leaders uh, effectively demonstrate um, empathy while also you know, steering their teams through challenging situations? I like empathy, right? And empathy makes every human alive, right? This is when you say, yes, you know, check mark, tick, I'm not a robot. But what really stands out for me as Renwa Habbal is not only empathy. In my next level is compassion. And I think that's ultimate, right? Uh, so empathy, by definition, Brilliant point. Yeah, by definition, empathy is when you, you know, uh, put yourself in in other person's position and understand it and uh, perhaps, you know, try to help that person um you know, throughout a certain struggle or a period of time where, you know, they need some further directions. Whereas compassion for me is much more than this. Compassion is when you are literally not only putting yourself and seeing, but actually feeling. You know, some people would, what, what happened with some people is like, you know, when you tell them that your, your eye is hurting, suddenly their eyes also hurt. Right. So they feel your pain. They just don't see it. So that's another level. Um, uh, and I gave that as an example. But, you know, coming back to business, um, compassion for me stands out. Right. So if you have like a team member and, uh, you know, 
the team, your one of your team members have actually lost a parent or lost uh, you know a family member of his or her own. Um, why not giving them that period of time where they grieve yeah. and uh, you know one month time off will not hurt you. Uh, you have a team. You are uh, a well, uh, you know, uh, rounded uh, leader. Where you know, perhaps you can take on the job. Why not? Or you can actually, you know, split the the tasks that that person has uh, been doing right over, you know, uh, the set of team members or the people in the business. And I'm sure people, when you tell them and you ask them nicely right that we need your help in x y and z because you know that person needs our support people no matter what no matter what and despite the workload that they have they will come together and they will help you and that team member who have actually lost a family member right so it depends how you say it if you are uh, following a command and control um, kind of leadership approach which was back in the 1900s 1900s right people today will say sorry i'm busy yeah but because today we operate in a in a very in a VUCA environment where, you know, the human aspect and the human emotions and the well-being hats are literally so present that you can't turn your eye away. But So when you ask them in a very, you know, nice, empathetic, compassionate approach, trust me, people will raise their hands and they will run for the support because they know it's reciprocal. So, um, Back to your question, uh, how do empathy plays a crucial role in an effective leadership? Um, leaders who are empathetic are those who will thrive simply in a VUCA environment. Why? Because they will support, they will get the support of their people. They will get the advocacy from their people. Nobody wants to work for someone or for a leader who is not empathetic or compassionate, right? Uh, and leaders have to remind themselves that on their back, there is a back, a bag, and that bag, it's called, you know, your reputation or your legacy. And my question, and this is what I always do in my coaching with my with the people that I coach, like, what if I have to unpack your backpack what do I find inside it? Do what? What kind of reputation, right? I will see uh, inside your backpack. Would I find, you know, followers who are advocating for you, or would I find people running away because they don't want to be led by you? So um, again, leaders have to remember that they're also humans and they're leading humans. Right, the leading businesses through the human uh, power. Let's put it this way. Yeah, that's a nice point. And um, yeah, building on that, I think um, uh, we would also want to discuss about psychological safety, another very key aspect of you know effective leadership. Right? Yeah. Uh, like build, cultivating an environment where uh, team members feel safe to voice their concerns and ideas. So, I mean, there are a lot of strategies that, you know, organizations and leaders can adopt and embed uh, in their business to create a psychologically safe culture. And psychological safety, to be honest, it's not it's not a one size fits all. You know, yeah. you as a leader, we have to as leaders actually in business, we have to think mm-hmm. that, you know, I, I lead a team or four or five, for example. Right. Do I operate or or deal with that person in my team the same way I ha- I am dealing currently with employee B or C or D or what, right? So we, I need to understand that, you know, my team is quite diverse and with diversity, come, it means uniqueness. And it means when I'm talking to someone, I really have to adopt a unique way in terms of how I communicate. So once I find uh, a path of communication that will help create a certain trust index, right? And yeah. I work towards, um, you know, enhancing that trust index, first of all, and on a one-to-one basis, this is when I start succeeding in creating the basics of psychological safety, right? So um, 
I can't deal with you the same way I deal with, you know, my other team member. And um, understanding that helps a lot leaders because I understand sometimes we're busy and sometimes we uh, we fall into the trap of, you know, managing and not leading anymore. And that's somehow, uh, you know, the trick being in a leadership position. But leaders can always foster a culture of psychological safety, honestly, with their team members by starting with the basics. And the basics is when you tailor your communication approach to each and every person rather than, um, you know, generalizing in terms of how you speak with your people. Because your people, they come from different backgrounds, yeah. especially in our region here in the UAE. I mean, there are 200 nationalities plus in this country. And I'm sure, you know, we deal at least with 10 different nationalities every day. So these nationalities, they can people, they, these people, they come from different nationalities. They come from different educational backgrounds. They have a different well-being. Uh, sorry, or, or they they are raised differently in terms of their upbringing and their well-being has been shaped based on the experiences that they have. Uh, you know, endured in their life, right? So my well-being uh, spectrum uh, or uh, index might be as not as healthy as others. So as a leader, I need to understand where are my people seated on the well-being spectrum and where are they on my trust index or where I am as a leader on their trust index. And based on that, right, I, I create a a culture of psychological safety with my team. I want my team to come to me to say, you know, I don't feel like working today. Um, you know, I my, my IQ is not operating at its highest and I need some time off. And I say, yes, please go ahead. I want them to come to me and I want to make sure that they do this with comfort. They do this with uh, with ease and with confidence that, you know, they need to know that I won't be judging. So that's how... Personally, I would, you know, think of psychological safety and elements of or strategies of how to create a psychological safe environment. And again, I mean, Zuka has been surrounding us throughout, you know, at least for the past 10 years or so. So a decade of Zuka, everybody has been working around that. And because of these turbulent environments, people, leaders have to be more open about that. So I leave it here. Uh, hopefully the audience who, who are listening to this podcast, uh, you know, will start thinking of better ways to uh, embed, create and foster um, psychological safety within their teams. Hmm. So the baseline has always been and will always be fostering a culture of uh, trust and transparency in the organizations. Always. Hmm. And um, looking ahead to. Uh, Narenva, um, if I ask you about uh, the three most essential skills or qualities that future leaders must cultivate, uh, what would be they? Uh, so three essential skills for qualities or qualities for leaders to, to cultivate so they can succeed in a VUCA mm -hmm. environment. Okay, so three things come to my mind, actually, as we are speaking. Um, learning to unlearn, right? We always you know, we always advocate for learning. And sometimes, you know, we say, okay, you know what, the ultimate way to learn for me is to go to university to study or to embark on a doctorate uh, a journey or something like that. Uh, and I feel, and I, and I actually, it's not only a feeling, but a realization that learning happens 360. It's all around us, right? So learning to unlearn, every experience comes in a, in a learning. You know, every adversity comes in a disguise and there are so much learning in it. So the power of adopting a growth mindset, and when I say growth mindset, is your ability as a human to wipe off what you have learned at some point in your life and empty that bucket at the top and make space to learn something new and keep a fresh lens, right? So this is what I this is what I mean when I say learning to unlearn agile um, agile ways of thinking, agile agile lenses. So you have to keep your keep your lenses clean, and of course being open to the experiences and the journeys that happen around you. So learning to unlearn is one skill. Number one, and uh, number two, I would advocate for communication right okay. so um now we are operating in a very 
yes, we're global and we are geographically dispersed, but we are more connected than any time in our lives because of the technology available, right? So if you are unable to communicate clearly, uh, I think this is when you know your message. You, you're gonna struggle sending a message across. So communication or mastering the art of communication or sending clear messages across to your community, to your society, to your team members is going to be pivotal for your success and for your relief as, uh, as well, right? Because when, when you are cascading a task as a leader, if the task is unclear because there is a communication obstacle, mm. obviously what's going to happen, right, there will be challenges on the task that is being performed. It might not end up reaching, you know, the goal targeted at the, at the pace that is required or you might not end up having the right result because of improper communication. So communication also is, is pivotal as a skill, right? And then the last one, um, I think uh, resilience, right? And when I say this, uh, people ultimately define resilience as your ability to, you know, to bounce back from setbacks as quick as possible. That is probably you know the most common terminology and as a resilient guru and a psychometric and a psychometric assessor in the domain mm -hmm. and i coach and train on resilience not only for like humans but also organizations as well right so i would say resilience in here is not about your ability just to bounce back quickly uh, it's a mix of let's put it, of spices, let's put it this way, that would lead to your resilience. So being resilient uh, means not only bouncing back, but how have you as a human, right, operated during that setback? How have you as a human, right, um, like what, what was the thinking during that setback? Uh, how did you uh, think? How did you operate? Uh, what have you done in that space? Um, and, and much more, like have you pushed people away or have you reached out to people for help or have you? So resilience for me is ultimate as a skill. The more resilient you are, the better you are able, first of all, to lead yourself and then to lead the people that work with you and eventually lead an organization to success. So if I have to summarize them in three words, it's learning to unlearn. Number one, um, master the art of communication. And number three, be as resilient as possible because that is the way forward for your own well-being and the well-being of the society around you. You pointed them out so well, Renva. Uh, and finally, it's... <laughs> I hope communication here was clear. <laughs> yes, very much, very much. Thank you so much. Uh, the time is, uh, you know, uh, taking and uh, we have just uh, five minutes in hand. So uh, as someone who believes in the power of, you know, building connections and giving back to the community, mm -hmm. uh, what would be your one piece of advice uh, to our listeners on maintaining personal well-being, Renva? On personal well-being. So, see, I'm I'm not one of those people who can literally tell you I'm mastering well-being. I'm a human. It means I do a lot of errors. It means when I tell you that, uh, you know, I take care of myself when it comes to exercising and eating healthy. Do I do this 24-7, 365 days uh, a year? Of course not. Yeah. Right? Uh, sometimes when I am being stressed, um I, I binge eating, right? Because my brain is hardwired to that certain activity. So what do I do here in this way? I, I actually looked out for, um, a health and fitness coach to help me understand my relationship with food. So again, you know, make sure that you understand, you know, how is your relationship with food? And I'll say this personally on, on a very personal experience, right? Make sure that you understand your, your kind of relationship with food because a lot of us today, and I, as someone who was once obese in her life, right, I managed to get myself on good terms when it comes to food. Why? Because food for me was my, my go to, um, zone when it comes to relaxing or numbing my brain but then i realized that the only person who's being penalized for that is me so how do i had to change and change comes from pain right so that's how people evolve in life um 
you struggle in a certain point, you you feel pain, and then you decide to change. And that change journey is when your resiliency is really tested. So I found someone who can help me with enhancing my relationship with food. And I found someone who can help me enhance my relationship with exercising. I had to test you know, similarly, when you go and buy cars, you have to test drive the cars. I had to test what really worked out for me, be it a gym or be it Pilates or be it exercising as uh, hit classes or be it belly dancing. I'm someone who loves to dance, for example. And I believe in that like, dancing is an international language similar to music. Right. And it has a certain level of intelligence because you're able to manage and control uh, intelligently how your body works. So focus on, on, on that, if I have to say so. And don't forget that by reading and, um, you know, you can start with, uh, with small bites of, re- of, of reading because reading will help your uh, brain activate, um, no matter how old you are when it comes to age, right? So reading, reading, sorry, keeps you young. And then what I found also is when you speak with the young, younger generation, this is when your brain also becomes very active and you will feel a lot of sparks. So, I mean, as someone who advocates for the youth, I'm aware of the generations and, you know, from baby boomers to Gen Alpha and soon Gen Beta, right? Throughout my tenor and throughout my career, I've always found that the time, the only time that I learn about new things is when I, you know, communicate with the youth and communicating and dealing with the youth has kept me on my tiptoes when it comes to innovation creativity, uh, taking care of myself because I always wanted and I always want actually to to stay young, to think young because, you know, uh, I think uh, learning doesn't have an age. And as I grow from an age, from a number perspective, I still want to make sure that I give back to the community by, you know, learning more, doing more, giving more. And, um, and that is one way for me to take care of my well-being as well. So for if you are a binge eater like myself, get a health coach. If you don't know what you need to do when it comes to your exercises, and I'm, I'm sure you know there are lots of uh, resources and and um, mm. uh, researches online that tells you when you exercise what happens to your body. Right, so exercise, no matter what is it, just exercise. Be it swimming, dancing, diving, um, hiking, trekking, just do something that will help your body stay active and always make sure that you communicate with the youth on a regular basis because learning happens over there. And you, if you really want to adopt and adapt a future thinking mindset, you have to speak with the youth because when you speak with you know the older generation what you will learn from them is the resilience the 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 the, the power of staying firm or firm, you know mm. so in terms of advice if i have to summarize what i said right i would say always try to communicate with the with the youth because the, these are the people or the community that will help you adopt a futuristic mindset so you can serve your community better. Um, if you have to fix your relationship uh, with the food, get a health coach. And if you don't know what are your hobbies, you literally need to test drive, you know, each and everything that comes your way, just like you are what testing or driving doing a test drive for the car that you want to purchase and you know as someone who works for a global automaker uh, i always say you know automotive leaders need to have the heart of an engineer and the brain of a business psychologist and this is one of the things that i always advocate for as well in in any environment because when you have yeah, uh, you know these two combined this is when you start uh, as the leader embedding embedding a psychological safe environment this is when you as a leader um, learn how to uh, take care of yourself because you you understand that you know um, uh, your brain which is the engine will not perform if you don't feed in some good octane and feeding it some good octane it's when you are managing your well-being well right and last but not least 
operating from the heart, keeping an open mind helps you keeping an open mind. And that's the only way to thrive in a VUCA environment because we are not, we have to remember, we are we are not dictated by our titles, uh, especially when we, uh, you know, reach a certain age of uh, retirement. Uh, we are uh, labeled by the reputation that I spoke about um, earlier on this podcast that basically tells us who we are, what is the legacy that we have left behind. So take care of you so people and others so others can take care of you as well. That's a brilliant pointer to wrap up this conversation, Grainva, but uh, this is just one episode and we would definitely want to join back to discuss this further. Anyway, thank you so much for this conversation. We have delved into so many dimensions of the VUCA world, but what stands out to me, Grainva, is how you seamlessly integrate them into an unified approach and it truly captures the essence of effectively, you know, navigating the complexities of a VUCA environment. And it's incredibly impactful. And I really, truly appreciate our discussion today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your input, your insights and your feedback. Again, VUCA is not the monster, right? Um, there, is all, there are always ways to tame that monster in a way or another. So think clearly. <laughs> Keep an open mind that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hope to meet you soon again for another episode. Thank you. Let's do that. Thanks for listening to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. Please do subscribe to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and our YouTube channel for new episodes.